Hey everybody, happy Friday. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over two decades of in, in the industry to answer any of your questions. Now, uh, for homeowners, for DIYers, anything you've ever wanted to know about painting, you can ask here. This is the largest group of painting professionals uh, in the world. The most knowledgeable people uh, who are doing this every day, you can ask us anything. Uh, also, for professionals, anything you want to talk about, accounting, apprenticeship, bookkeeping, uh, marketing, coding science, whatever you guys want. So thanks everybody for watching so far. Uh, today, I'm going to show you how to uh, get some paint on a carpet. Also, anything you guys want to talk about. So I want uh, topic suggestions from you guys. I see you guys all watching. Uh, Pat, Alex, uh, hello Alex, thanks for watching. Dustin, you too, Heather from the PDCA. Everybody suggest a topic. Anything you guys want to talk about today, comment down below. I'm going to show you how to get paint out of carpet and then we're going to go through a bunch of stuff like that. So, a um, couple things happening in the business now. Oh, we got Gustavo watching too. Jim, Clayton, thanks everybody. Uh, again, put your comments down below. Uh, suggest a topic. If you got a question, we'll certainly do that. Uh, a couple interesting things in the business now. Uh, we are doing a couple uh, experiments again. People know how much I love data and things like that. Uh, we are splitting most of my company up into the smallest possible bits that we can. Uh, we've experimented large crews, uh, different personality styles. We've, uh, we've tried uh, small crews, uh, all sorts of different arrangements, uh, combinations of people, and we are gonna be doing a three-month experiment where we basically break out everybody on their own. We're gonna, we're gonna morph we're going to, like the Transformers, you can join together into something, you can break apart and do something else. Uh, all that stuff will be, um, uh, will be experimented over the next three months and I want to gather some data. So the, the, I love data and when you group a whole bunch of people together, sometimes it's hard to parse out the little bits. Uh, we're going to split everybody apart and so I can gather uh, the most accurate data we can and then make some changes to the company. Uh, another big change that we've made is uh, we've moved entirely to a four day uh, a week plan. So we're going four 10 hour days, much easier in the winter uh, than, than, or excuse me, summer than winter sometimes. But then basically everybody in the company gets a three day weekend. I know uh, client concierge slash production manager Holly, she's probably still doing uh, five days, give or take. Uh, uh, I'm still out there uh, doing my Friday thing. Uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. I feel like I get a three day weekend now every week. So Friday mornings are kind of loose now for me. I can stay in the office longer. I can have longer periods where I just plug into something, uh, some business development stuff, uh, take care of standard operating procedures, checking in on other people in the company, things like that. And it's actually kind of nice now. And then uh, obviously the Ask a Painter show and then uh, yeah, so it's a it's a it's kind of a fun thing. Uh, so yeah, everybody's uh, we're trying to keep them to a, uh, a four day work week net right now, and I think that's a huge benefit for people. So, oh, let's see, Dwayne. Hey, Nick, finally took lunch at the right time. Uh, yes, thank you, Dwayne. Uh, Tina, also uh, awesome. One of my crew leaders there watching. Um, anything you guys want to talk about, comment down below. We'll get to it. Alex, I see you say marketing. Give me some specifics because that's a very very broad topic. Uh, as pointed as you can. Uh, Chris, James. Dan, uh, same thing too. Uh, today, I'm gonna show you guys how to get paint out of carpet and some other things, uh, my standard operating procedure to prevent it, and then uh, anything you guys wanna talk about. So the PDCA is the underwriter of this show, the Painting and Decorating Contractors of America, and uh, each, uh, each week they underwrite the show and then they use the show uh, for education purposes within the uh, industry in which, and within their website. Uh, and for that, they send me a question of the week, which I love because they're always random. They're always interesting. A lot of the times it's stuff I wouldn't have thought about. This week they said, how do you prevent spills? And when you do spill, what do you do? So very interesting now. Um, obviously we never spill paint, right? It just never happens. Um, I can think of a couple funny stories uh, back when I was younger. So the old man started me when I was 10 years old. Uh, Fernando, uh, Granado, uh, Bomgia, my friend. Uh, thank you for watching. Tell everybody down there I said hi. Um, so when I was a young guy, uh, we did a whole bunch of oil staining of cedar houses around lakes here in Minnesota. And we use very loose, very linseedy sort of oil stain. And we use lots of high ladders, 40 foot ladders, 30, uh, 32s, 38s, things like that. And when I was just a young guy, 13 or 14 years old, as soon as I could handle a large extension ladder, the old man sent me up and I don't think he ever used an extension ladder again. I think he was waiting for me to get out of school in the summer so I could do all the top halves of these houses. But uh, long story short, a lot of oil staining and um, uh, up, up on a uh, up on a ladder uh, with a probably full probably three-quarter full can of loose oil you know dark Cordovan brown stain 
<sighs> going to reach for it. You got oil stain on your hands, can slips out. 30 feet to the ground, that can goes in a perfect drop, just like this. It doesn't tumble, it doesn't wobble, it goes straight down like, hmm, you know, you're, you're standing there watching hmm, all the way down like this. The can hits the ground, and anybody who's ever seen this, this is a marvel of the universe. That stain, when that can hits the ground flat, shoots up 30 feet into the air again. It fell 30 feet. The stain, whatever happens to it there, it hits the ground in a perfect way where it basically shoots a geyser of brown stain straight back up into the air 30 feet. Now, thank God we we're staying inside of the house and there's just a little landscape rock and stuff, but if that thing was on a driveway in the sun, I would have been getting them a new driveway, at least a new seal coat. So uh, that was very comical. Um, not a big deal in the end, more embarrassing than anything else, but uh, not only a danger, uh, can also ruin a lot of stuff really quick. Uh, blacktop driveway probably wouldn't have been a big deal. You know, you got 400 bucks, uh, you can get a company to wash it and seal coat it. If that sucker was a concrete driveway, that would have been an apocalypse. <laughs> that would have been just horrible. So, all right, let's scroll up here a little bit. Uh, Alex, you mentioned advertising. Okay, I will get to that too. I have lots of thoughts for you, Holly. Thanks for watching. Uh, Tim Miller, uh, what four days do you do production on? Monday through Thursday is my preference. Now, yesterday we got rained out a little bit in the afternoon, so some people are cleaning up some jobs uh, to fill the schedule. But uh, Monday through Monday through Thursday, I like it. Just feels good to have like Fridays off, or at least attempt to have Fridays off. So, Fernando, thanks for watching. John, Dwayne. Um, we use a lot of the same processes and products that you do when it comes to our best finishes, especially cabinets. Let's see. I'm curious, however, how do you approach interior trim the same way you do cabinets? Okay, you got it, man. Um, I'm going to go over this carpet stuff first, and then we're going to talk advertising. We're going to go over trim versus cabinets, different processes like that. I have lots of thoughts. I have lots of standard operating procedures. I have lots of data. You guys know what you're in for. So number one, we have carpet. Uh, I went down to my awesome uh, hair uh, carpet store flooring store this morning and I was going to rummage through their dumpster and I just asked, hey, can I rummage through your dumpster? They go, hey, we can do even better. How about just some samples? So they just gave me some samples. So shout out to uh, Hairtel's Flooring today for uh, supplying the stuff that I'm about to sort of ruin. Uh, so basically the um, in the times that I can think of two times in my life and both of these happened when I was still working with a family business, when I was still a young guy and a little bit antsy, a little bit energetic and experienced where I got paint on carpet. Uh, two very interesting data points. Number one, you know, you're on a ladder, you got your four foot runner against the wall, the brush just slips out of your hand and in some awkward fashion just tumbles and sort of just hits, um, hits, the, uh, hits the carpet and it leaves a smudge. Um, immediately, obviously, you try to wipe it up like that and uh, you know, it dries and then it's harder to get off and things like that. So what I, uh, what I figured out was uh, this, and I'll do a little demonstration for you guys here, because this is fun. I have just standard sort of white paint, uh, white interior water based paint, and it sort of goes like this. You know, you're painting on the ladder, painting on the ladder, brush falls, and you get a little uh, blob of paint on there. So what I found is that as soon as this stuff dries, you're basically toast. So immediately what you do is you wet it. Now, most people don't have a squirt bottle of water. They have something else. Uh, use a rag, use something but keep this sucker wet. So in the best case scenario, you have some white water-based paint on a speckled carpet. You keep that sucker wet, you rotate your rag, both directions, all directions to get everything good. You catch it right away. I can still see a little bit of haze. I don't know if it's, so you can see on my fingers, there's just a little bit more. So the secret is, no matter how much paint you have on there, keep it wet. If it's a big spot of paint, get some plastic and cover it, mist it with water, mist the carpet around it. Uh, if, uh, let's see, let's put this thing back up here. So here's the problem uh, that people run into. It's like, fine, okay, we have a very forgiving carpet uh, that's probably new. It's probably got a little uh, Scotch guard in it. Uh, we have some white paint, very easy to wash up. What if you get something different? What if you have that maroon paint on a very cream colored rug and you can rub and rub and rub uh, until, you know, there's still gonna be a remnant of it there because those pigments you cannot get out. Here's the secret, keep it wet. So what, uh, what I've seen people do in the past is, so you get a very heavily pigmented paint uh, down on the carpet. I'll 
tilt that back down again for you. And immediately, you get a big red spot, uh, splotch of something on there. Immediately, start hitting it wet like this. You got your wet rag like this. And then intermittently, what you do is you take your other rag and you start scrubbing. So you pull this back, scrub a little bit, hit it with a little more of that, scrub it, keep it wet like that. And basically what you're doing is you're biding time until you can get a carpet cleaner. So uh, in the best world, you're working there with another person on your crew and you say, head down to that home store, head down to that hardware store, 20 bucks you can rent a rug doctor or something else. And all the while, you got one person there keeping that wet on the job site, another person there getting the rug doctor, and then you can do the, you know, they have the bristles, uh, the brush, the wand attachments, things like that, and just go over and over and over. Now, the only thing I'm gonna caution you is don't go crazy. Don't take a quart of water, a gallon of water, and dump it on the floor. Obviously, this stuff will migrate through the floor, and if you have a white ceiling down below, if you put enough water, it's gonna go right on through. But keep it wet. Another interesting uh, thing that happened when I was a kid, I mentioned the brush that kind of you know came out of your hand, and this is what I did. So what happened was, it was a white, probably not a very high grade paint, so there's not a lot of resin in it. So I first just took a rag and tried to wipe it all up like that. Um, that was okay, but it started drying out on the tips like that. So what I did was then I thought, well, you know, this is just water-based paint. It's not the highest grade paint, you know, it, it's not a hybrid or anything. So let's wet it. So I wet it enough and evenly that I actually reactivated the paint on the tips of that carpet. Now, I believe there was still a couple of little tips of the, um, oh yeah, there's the, stuff comes out pretty well. Now you can see on the little tips and most of this, um, most of the carpet nowadays is sort of the speckled Berber, which is probably good for a paint spill if there has to be one. Uh, but sometimes you get a little dried speck of paint on there and maybe you just get one drip of paint on the carpet and you didn't notice it and you're going to clean up, you're pulling up a drop cloth and you just see that one little speckled bit of paint. What you can actually do is cut that sucker off. Now scissors are best and you gotta be careful, but if it's one or two little hairs, one or two little pieces of Berber, just cut that thing off with that little speck of paint on and you're good to go. Now, do not give your uh, carpet a haircut. Do not get in here like this and, and start going to town like that or with the scissors and clipping it because if it's a very even pile carpet like that, you'll immediately see uh, where that stuff is. Okay, so uh, talk about how to prevent this stuff. Nick May, earlier in the day, uh, when I said, hey, we're gonna be spilling paint on carpet, let's talk about how to clean it. He made an awesome suggestion. Why don't you do something to prevent all this? So he asked if I had a system to prevent this and obviously I do. So what happens is, I'll show you guys this here. I'll pull up my SOP uh, for this specifically. Oh, come on now. Okay. This is one of the steps in the standard operating procedure. So number one, uh, when you get on a job site and like when you see this one, uh, this <coughs> excuse me, I was doing an estimate on this job site here. And as you can see all over this block, there's just paint and, and deck stain everywhere. So immediately what I do when I'm taking pictures of the deck, I document all the damage. I don't even know if I'm gonna get this job, but I'm documenting it. And in my Google Drive, I have a separate folder for job site images, the estimate walkthrough, and then there's always a folder that we have called damage, previous damage, previous you know items to look at, things like that. And we catalog all this major defects. And, and for you pros out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You get up on that roof and you see that somebody's been getting after it, there's paint all over the shingles and things like that. Immediately, we document that with our smartphones, put it in the folder. So step number one, don't get blamed for stuff you didn't do. So document that stuff. And you're not building a court case against your client, you're keeping honest people honest because after all this is done, and we actually just completed this deck this week, we use the same stain and the same paint uh, on this deck, same color. And uh, the previous painter had messed it up really bad. We had basically gotten it all back down to wood and started back over again uh, the right way with the right products. But we did the same color. And if we had a, a homeowner who maybe was on vacation during this stuff and came back, maybe didn't see that there was a bunch of previous damage to his property, he would say, oh my God, you guys, you got stuff all over there. If we had no pictures to prove otherwise, we'd be like, all you can do is trust us. And 
uh, in, in a world where we keep honest people safe, or honest people honest, we can say, hey, listen, uh, you know, thank you for letting me know, but here's a, here's a whole folder of images that I took when I was doing my estimate. You can clearly see we haven't started work yet. All, a lot of that stuff is previous damage. Listen, I'm just keeping honest people honest. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have this be a standoff between us, but here's what I saw beforehand, and there was so much of it that I documented it for this particular reason. And most homers are like, oh, wow, okay, no problem then, we're moving on. So, uh, let's see, the next, the next one. So, there are a couple other ways to prevent spills, or at least to stop, or to, or to lessen your chances of getting spills. And then we're gonna go back and talk about the, uh, the advertising and, and the trim process and things like that. So, uh, number one, uh, setting up a shop. So this is step four in my SOP. Step four in the SOP. And you can see down there, there is actually a uh, rectangle diagram right down here. Uh, that is a sample drop cloth and how I like my paint laid out on every job site. So I have a little mini demo for you here. As you can see, we have drop cloth down, and I am a huge stickler on neatliness, orderliness. Not everybody abides by it, but we're always working on it. So drop cloth goes down, and this is obviously in somebody's house. Uh, we, we put one down even outside in the grass, driveway, rocks, mulch, things like that. I have people put one down because you guys know what happens outside. You're pouring a five gallon bucket of paint, a little comes out, and now they got a big red spot in the grass, and you think, well, it's just grass, but clients don't like that, and it's gonna stay there for a while, too. So what we do is we lay down the drop cloth, even outside, and then for every one of our coatings, we have steps and lanes going here. So if there were 10 cans of Sherwin-Williams Fast Dry Primer, we would have one lane of 10 gallons stacked up nice and neat. We wouldn't intermix, we don't like sort of this thing, we don't like uh, doing this, because a lot of times on job sites, You'll have three or four different kinds of the same paint, but all different colors. And sometimes two or three paints of the same colors, but different shines, and you want to keep them separate. So we have clear delineations. And when we use a brush, a roller, a can, a something, we lay the brush, the roller, the something in a nice little step in a lane so that everything stays neat and orderly. And when things are neat and orderly, people have less a tendency to just bulldoze over them. Uh, also, drop cloth obviously will prevent any little spills when you're pouring paint, things like that. So. Hope that helps. Uh, I would love to hear if you guys have any other suggestions. Uh, once in a while, I used to throw like, you know, back when we only had one or two crews, I used to have the uh, OS can of uh, carpet cleaner. I didn't think that that stuff did any different than just keeping the stuff wet. So uh, what I've been doing is just, we got rags, every house has got water, and if you ever get something like that, just hit it with a little water and you're good. Oh, I forgot, I got sidetracked, but the, uh, second, the, the second time that I got paint on carpet as a young fella, um, uh, a basement remodel on a lake home. Beautiful, beautiful high-end lake home. Billiards room, dark, dark, like, you know, a uh, uh, hunter green sort of carpet. Really low nap, like uh, almost a commercial grade, but fine. i sure it was some kind of, you know, 100% wool, super expensive, things like that. Um, and, you know, just sitting there painting. It's a light tan color, give or take, and brush comes out of the hand, hits the carpet, and I thought, oh my God, like this whole thing has just been redone. There's a super expensive carpet under here. What in the heck is going to happen? So I got down there with a, I grabbed a paper towel from their wet bar right there. I wiped it up and it came right off. And I was just kind of looking around like, wow, that was impressive. And uh, the only thing I could attribute that to was insanely expensive carpet, probably treated with Teflon, with Scotch Guard, with uh, some sort of treatment to do that. And it cleaned up perfectly. It's almost like the, the carpet had like a rain jacket on it or a waterproofer on it like that. And I thought, I'm the luckiest man on the face of the planet for that. Again, young guy on a job site, last thing I want to do is call the old man saying, hey, listen, I've never seen carpet like this. It's super fancy. I don't know where you get it, uh, but I just ruined it. And this was going to be, you know, your 20 by 30 sort of area like that. So I can't imagine how many weekends and summers I would have had to work to pay for that stuff back. So yeah, that's basically how I do it. Keep it wet. That's the best, uh, best way to handle that stuff. So Okay, let's talk about, let's go back to the questions. Do advertising, uh, best success you've had. Okay, lots of thoughts. So what I like to do is talk about feelings and data. Uh, the feelings is, if you, if you read the Business Brush Group, if you read the uh, standard internet where painters interact with each other, uh, social media groups, you would get the impression that all painters get their leads from social media. 
Um, and people like to think because we can get in there, we're on Facebook anyway, we got this crazy dashboard, we can manipulate statistics and, and demographics and kind of hone in and then there's feedback like impressions and views and things and, and uh, honestly though, if you, if you look at industry statistics uh, and some of the largest paint manufacturers in our industry do very, very in-depth sort of market research on this stuff, they still find that, I believe the last time I heard this, 70 to 80 percent of all business comes from word of mouth and referrals, the old style way. So we think we're geniuses on social media, like, oh my God, I got 900 impressions on this picture I put up. But if you actually track it back to how many people saw that, were impressed and impressioned by it, uh, did something about it, contacted you, asked for a quote, got the quote, accepted the quote, did the job, paid for the job, and would refer you to somebody else, I think that number is very, very low. Now, if you put all your eggs in that basket and, and work that thing like a dog, you will get results. Like I know other contractors um, in the industry too where they'll say, I'm an Angie, I'm a LinkedIn guy, this and that. And any one of these things can produce results, but you have to be consistent, you have to do it all the time, you have to be effective, constantly updating, constantly manipulating, getting feedback, A-B testing and doing that. You can't just you say, oh my God, it's December, I'm slow. I'm just gonna put a picture of a before and after on Facebook uh, on, uh, of a bedroom and I'm gonna just drive a bunch of work. It, it just sort of doesn't work that way, you know? Marketing is a tough thing. And um, so, I, I, before I go into that, I will say this. We think we're geniuses on social media and yes, we can drive some stuff from social media, but still, if you had to look at most painting businesses, uh, word of mouth referrals, past clients are gonna be the big things. Uh, the next big thing, uh, oddly enough, this isn't sexy, it's not exciting, it's direct mail. Uh, every door direct mail, postcards, flyers, door hangers, things like that, honestly, talk to some of the people who run monster paint businesses in the industry and magically you'll find that uh, a large portion, a large portion of what, uh, of what they do uh, for business is still from, you know, they sent out 10,000 postcards or direct mail or EDDM, every door direct mail. And that drives a lot of business to them. So that's sort of, you know, it, it's not sexy, it's not great, it's not super innovative, but it does work. And uh, I've experimented over the last two years uh, boosting winter marketing in specific neighborhoods with postcards and door hangers and things like that. And it did much better than social media stuff. Now, I put, um, I put much more effort into social media just to see if it was a good test. Uh, I put way less effort into the postcard stuff. You basically just make a postcard, have a company print them and mail them off for you. And the return was much greater on the mailings and things like that. So, um, but, you know, I do that because like, I, got, I got a lot of people to keep busy. If it was just me and maybe up to four guys, word of mouth, um, neighbor referrals, past clients would be all you need. Um, the first thing that I did uh, when business started to grow, I think I got past five painters. And then I started feeling winters like, ooh, I'm gonna have to drive a little more work. It was harder to scrape up jobs and keep people busy. So the first thing I did was just went back to my past clients. I mean, I keep a list of everybody's you know, contact info and everything like that. And you basically uh, just start sending out postcards, doing emails, things like that, and uh, driving, driving uh, you know, uh, notices to past clients to get work too, because you've already been vetted with them. They, you're a known quantity. That's your highest uh, area of target opportunity, something like that. So Alex, I hope that helps. Um, it's a good mix there, let's see. Uh, Dwayne, we use a lot of the same products and uh, processes and products when you do when it comes to finishes, especially cabinets. I'm curious, however, uh, do you approach interior trim the same way you do with cabinet finishes? Yes, absolutely. So our SOP for cabinets is exactly the same as our SOP for trim. Uh, we, we abide by the SVT system, sand back tack. So basically we abrade the surface somehow, we vacuum up uh, anything that's on there, and then we use microfiber rags with water almost completely wrung out to get rid of any of that last little fine powder on there so there's no adhesion, uh, adhesion issues. And then we oil prime. Uh, oil primer is cheap, awesome, and plentiful here in Minnesota. So we're gonna use that until they pry it from my cold dead hands. Uh, we apply oil primer, we SVT again, sand back and tack, and then we apply two top coats. Uh, and we, we're big fans of hybrids, uh, the emerald trim urethanes, the advances, the things like that. I've uh, been experimenting with some other uh, 2K polys, 1K polys, uh, water-based systems, things like that. Um, for a lot of reasons, uh, for my type of business, uh, for my type of people, for my type of jobs, and for what we do, there's, there's good and bad to so all those things. But right now, uh, yeah, we basically do the, let's see if I can grab one. 
we basically do the same thing we do to cabinet doors uh, as we do trim or trim uh, to cabinet doors. You know, we, we're, we're big fans of we're big fans of oil primer and two coats of hybrid top coat. I don't try to complicate it. I, I see a lot of people doing three coats of bin primer and then uh, they do two top coats and then they do clear coats. And there's so much chemistry in there that everybody's messing with and I don't think they fully understand it. I mean, you're messing with, in a system like that, you're messing with an alcohol-based shellac, which is super brittle, not uh, water resistant at all. You can sand right through it. It does a great job of blocking stains, but doesn't always stick to everything. And then you have hybridized technology. And then a lot of times people are going over with a water-based clear. So you're mixing three technologies that cure at different rates, off-gas at different rates, dry, stick, look, wear at different rates, and it's very, very tough. So, um, yeah, I would, I would just caution you. Uh, if there is the tried and true, I got brought up in the old school of painting where if, if you need to block a stain or make something stick, you prime it and then you do two top coats. If there's no stains and you don't need it to stick, you do two top coats. You can invent all sorts of crazy ways of doing this. Like uh, one of my original woodworking systems back when I was a single painter, I took insane pride in my woodwork. I was ultra productive. So I was doing like a four coat process on most of my interior woodwork and it was overkill. Nobody saw any value after two top coats. Uh, I took a lot of pride in it. I thought it was cool, but nobody knew the difference. Even when I explained it, they're like, yeah, fine. It's great. That's what we expect. And that's good. So it's always tough like that. Uh, so listen, I'm, I'm all for doing crazy, insane coating systems. But honestly, if you have to serve a mass market, if you're a residential repainter, you have to give people the most value uh, and you want to keep your systems tight and predictable. And oil primer and hybrid top coat is ultra, uh, ultra predictable. So. All right, let's see what else we got here. Da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody for watching here. Oh, I talked to Phil yesterday. Phil Klein, my, my friend from uh, Iowa there. Uh, Alex Marchuk, uh, direct mail. So Alex, I would say depending on your business size, uh, anywhere from like one to three or four painters, I would number one, uh, make sure you have a presence in your area. I mean, when people see you and see your family and everything else, that's built in trust. Number two, uh, hit your past clients up. Uh, number three, join a bunch of community groups. Uh, I volunteer uh, for a lot of different groups and it shows that you're invested in the community. And not only that, it's super fun to be part of those groups. You meet a lot of people and you're actually invested in your own town. Like I'm on the Economic Development Authority in my, in my town here. Um, in the past couple of years, we bought a farm, a small farm, and developed it for industrial land. And we're selling lots to industry to lower the tax burden on the rest of the people in the town, uh, the residences. So uh, it's fun. Uh, and you get to meet a lot of good people. You're in on land deals. Uh, you're actually creating jobs or the opportunity for people to create jobs and it's fun and, and people see you around town too so it adds credibility. Um, but yeah, I would, I would certainly go to the past clients. Direct mail is real expensive and the return is real low but it's a lot better than Facebook a lot of the time. So um, you're, what you're going to find is that uh, guys love Facebook because it's fun, it's accessible, it's sort of of our generation. But there's a certain type of client that I found you're going to get from Facebook and there's a certain type of client you're going to get from direct mail, referrals, past clients, things like that. Um, the direct mail, the referrals, the things like that, people tend to be a, a little older client, a little more serious client. Facebook, what I found is that the demographic is definitely younger and younger means that they're usually curious about you, the process, the price coatings, things like that, but they're still kind of one foot in. I might do this myself. I might do, I might have you do it. And uh, most of the time they're just curious about the process and I don't fault them for it. Uh, they're young. They, they want to know what this is like. Usually they're newer homeowners, less than five years. And I don't poo poo any of that stuff. I try to help them as much as I can, but also I cannot drive two hours to tell you how to paint something and to drive two hours back and, and not get a job too. So I want to be respectful of that. And I, you know, have them be respectful of uh, the family time I have in the evenings too. So. Ah, Dwayne, yep, we use microfiber rags, SVT, oil primers, and hybrids. Yeah, it's a great, great, uh, it's a great sort of thing. So, Dwayne, are you spraying residential trim uh, or brushing? We are spraying. Um, what's interesting is that if you, if, you, if you have a good training program and you have a tight SOP, sometimes it's actually easier to spray than brush trim. I, having done... You know, if I've been in the industry for 25, 27 years, I've probably brushed more trim and cabinets than I have sprayed, and I've done a lot of spraying. As, you know, basically from 10 to 26, 
27, I basically, I didn't own a sprayer and neither did my dad and we just brushed everything. Uh, and since then I've, I've adopted sprayers obviously, but um, I honestly think it takes more skill to get a fine finish with a brush on trim and cabinets and intricate things than it is with a sprayer. Um, the, the downside, well, the, the plus and minus would be if you're gonna brush everything, it takes way less prep. Uh, you can just get after there with a brush. So if you're an experienced vet, knows how to use a brush, you can get a super nice finish and save a whole bunch of prep time. Um, if you're gonna spray, we spend probably 60% of our time prepping and de-prepping and then a little bit of time spraying in between. Um, I'm trying to think in an average kitchen, if a kitchen takes 40 to 50 hours to do, uh, give or take, we're probably spending 60% of that time just prepping. And in a lot of big kitchens where we're doing walls, ceilings, island a different color, this and that, we'll spend the equivalent of about 40 hours just prepping before anything even gets primed. So it's a lot, a lot of effort there. Um, so yeah, thoughts on that. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, I do appreciate everybody watching. Kindest thing you can do is to share this show. Get more like-minded people like us on here. Uh, I love interacting with everybody. Uh, I'm glad I could put a bunch of paint on carpet and wipe it up today. That's a lot of fun. Um, so yes, thank you everybody. Uh, share the show, like the show, follow Ask a Painter on Facebook. And as, uh, as always, I'll be on here after. If you guys have any other questions, just keep the questions, keep the comments going. I'll be there. And, and as always, have a good weekend. We'll see you guys next week.